Hello, George Byrne. Welcome on VH Berries. Hi, Victor. So nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Your name is in yellow, the title is in orange, and what's inside is brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you were able to get your hands on the book. I am very grateful to have this uh, copy of your book called Post Truth. Yes. <laughs> so, what is the meaning behind the title of this piece of art? Well, the title of the book uh, is actually based off a, a single image that I worked on of the same name. Uh, and as it turned out, when we were putting the, the book together, um, you look for an image that you think sums up things as clearly as possible and maybe represents the body of work best and most clearly. And uh, as we were going along, I, I, I figured that image, the image called Post-Truth, um, was strong and I think would was going to work in terms of conveying the broader ideas of, of how my work has evolved and also uh, just do a really good job of being bold and impactful and simple and a, a really one of my more basic images that communicate the things that I do uh, and I you know you're thinking this thing is going to be on the front of a book competing with a million other books um, I wanted something strong so that was how I chose it um, Why the, t why the term post-truth, I think, worked for the book cover um, and the title of the book in general is because um, that uh, premise, post-truth, uh, resonated with me as a way of describing how my uh, work had evolved from the beginning of my um, photography days to where I am now, where I was when I released the book, which was um, last year, 2020. Um, the term, uh, you know, if you look it up in the dictionary, means um, a, uh, a world in which um, uh, a world in which uh, legitimate truth no longer stands for anything and no longer has um, currency. And I think um, the premise of being beyond that, post that, uh, had a had an indirect relationship to my own relationship with the photographic medium and that I was pushing it from what it was invented for, which was to record the truth, to record how things were, uh, to, um, to me using photography, uh, in a, in a, in a way, in a more malleable way, um, treating it like it wasn't static and it was something that I could mold and massage and sculpt into what I wanted it to be. Um, So that, that's where my photography um, has, has evolved to uh, in the later parts of my work. And um, so the term, the term fit um, and is also a term that I think had, had trended, uh, as you probably know, in, in all sorts of realms. Um, we live in a time where media has been fragmented to the point where everyone chooses their own news source, uh, whether it's their, their favorite you know, talking head on Facebook or, or CNN or Fox or whatever it is. Um, and I think uh, we've gotten into a bit of trouble in terms of having some sort of consensus on reality and truth. And, and so there has been, yeah, it, it worked on, on different levels and different layers. Uh, but um, I was happy that it also spoke very clearly about the actual work itself. And um, that was how it became to be the, the um, sort of representation of the book. I can completely feel the simplicity through the 56 images in this book. And it all started in 2010 on September 23rd. Yes, that was the day I first landed in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've read the forward. Good work. Uh, I, I, um, I, I grew up in Sydney and... Uh, I'm 45 now, and when I was 34, I decided I wanted to move to America. So I worked out how to do that, and I, I got a visa. Um, they gave me two and a half years to, to work there as a musician, actually, at that point. Um, and the day I arrived was uh, that, that fateful day. And um, 
as I described in the foreword to the book, I had a very immediate um, visceral sort of reaction to the landscape I saw in Los Angeles and um, the uh, the work and the, the sort of path I'm on now is very, very much connected to that very initial sort of um, response I had to this very alien landscape as it was to me. Do you work on photography and visual art the same way you were doing music because each image is, is a sort of tone and they need to uh, accord each other to create a sort of symphony. Wow, it's so true. I've never heard anyone um, say that before, but as a musician, I do see a lot of parallels to the way I as assemble images and the way a chord might be assembled. Um, I'm looking to find a harmonious collection of things and it's a mixture of, of um, dissonance and also things working in harmony. And so um, I'm not at all thinking of music while I'm making photography. It's funny, I, I do, uh, it feels like two separate sort of mental spaces in my head. Um, if I'm in the midst of working on pictures, I, I, I pick up a guitar and I can't make anything happen. I feel very out of touch with that medium. I have to be immersed in it for it to start to... <laughs> so if I put photos down for a month and go to music, then things will start to feel good and, I, you know... Uh, but otherwise, I just feel like I'm toying with it. I pick up... I do have guitars around and I play with I play with it a little bit, but... Um, No, I think there's definite parallels to how I approach both the mediums, even though they don't consciously overlap in my head. Um, I do, I do think it's it's there in my subconscious. And then, George Byrne, you took uh, works that picks up from uh, 2014 to uh, 2015 with two of your best friends. The Mamiya 6 and Pentax 67. Yes. Oh, my best <laughs> friends. That's maybe pushing it, but they were very close companions. <laughs> um, no, I admire the old cameras. The, the, what what uh, Victor's talking about, if you're listening, is these old cameras that I use to take my photos. They are medium format film cameras. So they're both 20, 30 years old. Um, when things were engineered to last more than 12 months, which is what the new iPhone cycle is, you know. So these things are, are amazing, and I've, I've ended up using them to produce most of my work. Um, very sturdy, uh, reliable cameras. I lost one. One was, was stolen out of the back of my car uh, a couple of years ago, so I had to replace that. But otherwise, I've had the same cameras for, for many, many years, and uh, they have both they've served me well. I feel that you have a special relationship with nostalgia because of this uh, very precious object that uh, takes you back in the California of the 80s and 90s. Yeah, well, it's funny. The California of the 80s and 90s still exists on the ground in California. And that's partly why uh, I think people are get, get so um, seduced by the aesthetic there it's 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 a city that has somehow managed to retain a lot of the um the relics of the of that period and um i'm not sure whether they it was intentional because it's not a city famous for preserving its heritage in any way it's more like in with the out out with the old in with the new sort of idea um but yeah it's a big enough city la uh, i guess we're talking about la when we think southern california that's the dominant city by far um It's a gigantic spread out city of multiple cities, really. And, um, I, I found, uh, I found out there I was spotting things that I wouldn't normally see in, in other cities, uh, whether it was sort of the, the motel signs or, um, how shadows were intersecting, um, streets and, and, faded street lines and the, and the red, the rich lipstick red of the curbs there and the, these popping bollards everywhere. Yeah, I found, I found it a real visual symphony that I wasn't expecting and I had to almost convince myself to pursue this because I was conscious of what I was looking at was very little. It was, there was nothing there. 
so to speak. It was just a sort of interaction of elements that I found very, um, very beautiful, actually. And uh, look, I'm not pretending I'm the first photographic artist or, or artist in general to be to be looking at these things, but um, <laughs> I I think I brought a I tried to bring a unique perspective, um, especially as I started to augment manipulate my work um, to to that very aesthetic that that we're talking about. And George Byrne, part of this very unique perspective. And aesthetic is the fact that every single of the pictures can be um, compared to paintings because of the very powerful colors and uh, the fact that your life is a bit like uh, paintings every year, adding new layers to it. I know. I'm starting to get very many layers now. The, the paint is getting thick. <laughs> uh, But yeah, no, I, I mean, back to my influences, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a huge lover of painting and I have just as many, if not, if not more painting idols than I do photography ones. So I think as my work's evolved, I've, I've been lucky enough to find a way to tap into my, um, instincts as a painter and apply them to my instincts as a photographer. And it's that, it's that blending that, um, I feel I'm doing my most interesting work as an artist. I am also very curious about your mentors and inspiration because in Post Truth, your book, you are quoting some very uh, interesting figure. Nathanael West, John Fante, David Ockney and Edward Russia. Yes, well, actually, um, Ian Volner, um, he wrote the essay, I think, that you're, you're talking about that, that opens the... The book? Absolutely. Yeah, he, he is a brilliant writer and he, um, he brought a very fresh perspective to what I was doing. And that was the goal was to find a great writer that I respect who comes from a different world. And he's more an architecture writer traditionally, but he's very well, um, versed and, um, he's, he's, he's a great, um, thinker and a great sort of philosopher in his own right, Ian. And, um, he i knew would bring would bring a really really interesting perspective on my work and his his influences and all his the sort of the way he thought of my work was through literary reference which i thought was really refreshing and different um i've had my own sort of favorite writers to come out of um Kerry, like Kerry mcwilliams and um uh ask the dust who wrote us the john fante um there's a whole host of Of famous and Bukowski, you know, famous writers who've, who've managed to encapsulate <laughs> the essence of Southern California and LA specifically. Um, but Ian was, was able to take that and take it to another level. And, um, I really enjoyed his perception of my own work. Um, as an artist, it's always interesting to get outside perspectives because you get very, very caught up in the creating part of it. Uh, and a lot of the, creative process for a lot of artists is is subconscious you know i'm not consciously going oh here i'm going to quote here or here i'm going to reference this or here i'm going to reference that all these things are buried in your head over your entire life and you're um, sourcing them often subconsciously and hopefully pressing up on the unique thing that you have brought to the table in terms of your own sort of aesthetic filter um But I really enjoyed his, 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 um, essay and the way he, um, he really personalized my work and took the viewer onto the streets of LA and really almost sort of it was a guided tour of, of the aesthetics and the essence and the feeling and the mystery of the streets of Los Angeles that I think are imbued in the work. If I understood correctly, Ian Volner helped you to clarify your objective. For example, the word uh, he used are very uh, beautiful. For example, roaming the street pace, collecting fragmentary visions, opportunistic snapshot of the urban scene. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
And that's, <laughs> that's largely what I was doing, especially early on, especially when I'm in the collection phase of what I, what, of what my work entails. Um, that's what I'm doing. I'm just going off instinct. I'm driving around. Often I, I'm either on my way to work or I'm on my way to the laundromat or whatever I'm doing. I've got the camera in the back of the car. And if something looks interesting, I jump out and take a few photos. Um, and makes me a hunter of sorts. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, I think p- part of what the last couple of years has been about is, is stopping, sh- is, is shooting less and working more on the work that I've already taken. Cause I've taken way too many photos. I've taken enough photos to last me the next 40 years, I think. Um, and now I have had a, have had the luxury of not having to troll the streets as much. Um, and that came in handy, especially last year or the last sort of 18 months with, with the pandemic, not being able to get around as much. Um, it came to sort of push that natural development that I was doing. And, and I think it sped it up in the sense that I, I was, um, heading that direction, but then forced to take a bit, a bit more of a jump and, um, start to get more creative with the, with the images that I'd already shot. And with the images that you already shot, they've been exposed everywhere in the world. And, uh, for example, uh, when we are talking right now, there is an exhibition and exposition in Shanghai, China, yeah. and another one coming very soon in Australia. Yeah. I've been lucky this year. I, I met a gallerist in Shanghai called fiber gallery uh, that, I, that I didn't know and I I'm not you know um, I haven't been able to get I've visited China once in my life so I know very little and um, all I know that I've always been fascinated with with uh, with the country and especially Shanghai as such a hub of creativity um, so it's been a real thrill to be able to have uh, quite a big solo exhibition there um, I've been seeing the videos come through just like you I've, I've I'm just trying to go off what I'm seeing in pictures and video, but it looks so well done and they've done an incredible job in actually installing some sculptural elements in the gallery space to um, mirror the images on the wall and they've painted like street lines inside the gallery and uh, it's been really, really good. So um, I'm hoping to develop, yeah, a nice long ongoing relationship and I'll be able to go back there um, maybe next year. And George Beeren. I am very curious about, as you mentioned, the fact that you grew up uh, in Australia, in the town that was near Sydney, but very far from Sydney. And uh, because you have a very uh, special uh, burn uh, household. Yes. Uh, well, when you say... Um in Sydney, but far from Sydney, you mean reference to the to the suburb I grew up in in Sydney called Balmain. Uh, that was yes. very much a small town in a big town, and the reason uh, this was possible is because it was a peninsula suburb surrounded by water. If you know Sydney Harbour, it has all these little bits of land jutting out inside the harbour. I was on one of those bits of land, and. Um, one of the oldest suburbs in, in all of Australia, actually. It's where very, some of the first sort of industry was established in Australia was the town, the little village, uh, village, but they call it a village. It's not really a village. It's like a little mini town in the middle of the big city. Um, so, uh, I felt very lucky. We grew up, we grew up in a very, um, beautiful, interesting little village. Um, and there was a strong creative, vein in that place um, for whatever reason a lot of artists and musicians and scientists and all sorts of people have come out of that area um, and uh, and the second part of your question was to do with my family absolutely because you were on the suburbs with a very special household very connected to cinema music and the arts yeah, yeah. Well, my parents were not really. So us kids, I have three sisters, um, and we all have ended up um, drifting towards creative fields for whatever reason. I'm not sure. I think it's because our parents just gave us the freedom to do what we wanted to do and uh, were always <laughs> very, mostly always supportive. Um, 
the only time my parents weren't a hundred percent supportive was when I tried acting, and they looked at um, a short film I did, and I remember my dad going, "Yeah, hmm. not bad, not bad." And everything else I'd ever done, I could tell. <laughs> I could tell he was like, "Nah, you're under something." He calls me Johnny. He's like, "Johnny, you're under something with that. That's great." Um, so. Um, no, we've all been very lucky, all of us. And uh, my my younger sister Rose is a, a very well known actress now. She's she's doing so well. Um, she's lived in the states for the past twenty years, so it's been good to see more of her over here. But um, I have another elder sister, and then uh, one more sister above her. So we are three girls and one boy. And it goes: Rose is the youngest, me, and then Alice who's a painter who lives in Melbourne and my elder sister Lucy lives in Sydney and she works in um, in book publishing. This is very funny uh, because George Byrne, one of your uh, goal for the future is to make short films. So you just have to <laughs> cast your sisters, for example. Just not cast myself. That's the, that's the trick. Um, yeah, I am, I'm very interested in, in trying to make a short film. I, you know, there's clear parallels to what I'm doing and, and the film being a visual media, but uh, it's the things I know less about, the, not the filming and the, the framing and the photography. It's, the, it's the, the working with people that I'm most interested in. And um, so it's, it's a goal or a dream that I think I, I'd love to have a go at at some point. Um, and I expect to try it and then be, you know, shocked at how difficult it is. That's, that's what I'm expecting to happen. Um, but yeah, I, I'm keen to, to do that and, and a bunch of other things in the coming years. In definitive, George Byrne, you're going to switch from playing tennis alone to playing soccer, which is a sport team. It's a metaphor. That's perfect. Yeah. I've never thought of it like that. Um, but it's true. And that's part of what appeals to me about working in film. You collaborate, you laugh all day if it's going well. Um, you manage people and they manage you. And it's, it's, it, it's, yeah, I mean, I've been so close to it my whole life and I've seen it. Um, and I think there's a part of me that is very interested and sort of drawn to that. But clearly, uh, I like the self-driven isolated arts as well because I've done them for so long. Music as well. I, I, when I was, musician full-time I was a singer-songwriter so operating a little bit like I do now I write the songs privately do all the sort of press and, and then I put the band together give everyone the music and we all train up together and then we go on tour and play gigs and that's how it worked um, not that collaborative I mean you you do great you get amazing stuff from the good musicians that you work with but ultimately the creating part is is done um just with me or maybe with one other person if I did a co-write. Um, so yeah, definitely a team sport. Um, and I have a bunch of very um, supportive people around me. I know so many actors now and um, people that work in the industry that would be able to, to help me in, in something. But I, I, have a, I have a feeling the smart way to work would be to start small and then if, if I like it, build it up slowly. So um Yeah, I'd probably start by doing some sort of vignettes where I'm, where I have two, one or two or three actors just doing something very simple, um, like a sort of conversational short film. That would be what I think I would do, and um, and just see what happens. Yeah. Furthermore, George Byrne, I believe that whenever uh, the media you are going into, the messages will always remain the same yeah well like we we've discussed briefly the music and how that can relate to to art um and i think there's definite sort of um crossover there and it's just it's so fascinating to me is how that could how that could go to a film i don't know you just don't know these things until you try them you jump in and see what happens i i think um I think part of what appeals to me and scares me at the same time of film is that there's, you have a lot of people relying on you to do everything and there's a lot of planning involved. The, plan, the P word, planning, terrifies me because 
I do a lot of my stuff ad hoc and I just feel it as I go and I can make my own plans and change them at the last minute and go off how I feel. And with films, there's not, there's none of that. You got to turn up, you got to be there, you got to get it done. Like it, it's a formula and it's, there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, and I know that from visiting a lot of sets and seeing how it works. And it's funny, you, you go to a set for the day, you'll see about four minutes of action and then 16 hours of people just sitting around moving lights and taping things to the wall and like it, it's incredibly slow work um but uh yeah we'll see and we'll see at this moment it's, it's still a little bit of a, a fantasy but um i do think uh it's an inevitable thing that i'll try and it'll be at a point where i've i've got a break from what i'm doing um with photography um but i have had I've been lucky to have a very busy five or six years and I haven't really t had a break or taken a beat at all um, in that time. And that's been um, a huge blessing, but at the same time, yeah, I've had to sort of blinker my creative output in order to achieve the results that I, that I wanted to, I set out to do as an artist. And um, I feel, I feel good about how that's gone. I feel like I've, I've honored that instinct and I've done everything that I could I couldn't spend any more time than I have on on the process and the art itself and um, it's been a great learning sort of curve of, of the results you can get when you do uh, go all in so to speak and put all your efforts into a single thing um, and so yeah the counter to that is you know to to do other things to keep your mind fresh and to keep growing and keep evolving um, and whether I did a, f a short film or did a a record or did something else on the side I think um, it could only ever have a positive influence on on the art if that did to continue to be my main thing um, as you would uh, as you would only pick up experience and and grow as a person and for this formula we will always see George Byrne a signature style which include gas station and pitch wall <laughs> That's right. That's all I'll do in film is just shoot gas stations and colorful walls. And that could be my, <laughs> that could be my signature. Um, you know, the other thing I would be thinking of be doing as an artist is, is, is building. I'd like to construct my photos as 3D sculptures at full scale. That's a, that's a thing that I really am is starting to enter my dreams at night when I go to sleep. Um, is seeing, is seeing because so many of my images are built the backdrop is the desert um, whether it's LA or Palm Springs or wherever I'm shooting it's there's these sort of beautiful misty mountains in the background and sort of vast vast desert scapes that are just creeping into the back of the images and I would love to take the the image and actually physically build it in the location that I'm fabricating in post-production so sort of full circle you know I'm bringing the the artificial manipulated image, the dreamscape, if you will, to the, to the location, to the background where it, it is based and then shooting it again, you know, shooting the, the actual sculpture in, in location. Um, and I actually, I've had this idea of having, having like a double sided wall and I'm really inspired by Broadway, Broadway backdrops. If you've ever been to a play, any play, but I guess a higher production play where they actually build elaborate sets. I'm all, I'm always spending half the time in the theater staring at the set. I, I just find it so incredible how detailed and believable and convincing that they make the sets. You know, you'll, you'll be at the sort of interior of some, you know, 1920s mahogany mansion and you feel like you're there and it's just, It, it just blows my mind. And so I, I would love to apply that sort of artistry and, and detail work to creating um, some 3D renderings of my photos and putting them out in, you know, on location. Um, how I'm going to do that, Victor, I have no idea, but I'm just trying to manifest at the moment. So it's early days. Maybe you are going to try and find the answer by uh, walking in the street of Montreal. Exactly. Or up at the beautiful Mount Royal Park. That's where I've been spending all my time. <laughs> Thank you so much, George Byrne. And uh, I'm, I'm showing the book again. So post-truth, I am uh, 
showing it right now. Thank you so much, Victor. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you and meet you. And um, I look forward to chatting again.